Good morning. Welcome to Sunday View. How are you doing? It's Sunday morning, the 30th of June, 2019. I'm Richie Allen, broadcasting live from Salford in Greater Manchester, where it's a bit cooler today than it was yesterday. The temperatures peaked at 32 degrees here yesterday afternoon. Sweltered, we did. We sweltered. I will be looking through the UK Sunday newspapers as usual and some of the stories inside as well. We'll hear from the Mar show and we'll hear from the Sophie Ridge show and I hope to hear from you. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That is my Twitter handle. Send me a tweet now and welcome to the programme. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv It's the Richie Allen Show Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world And now, here's your host Richie Allen Lovely stuff, hi to Marie Good morning Marie In God's country That's uh, Marie, Nick Free, and how you doing Marie? Thanks for listening to the programme. Hi to Coca Bell as well. Singer, songwriter there. Right, let's look at the papers then. Loads to talk about, lots happening. This is Europe's most listened to independent radio show. It is live right now on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester. It's on triggerwarning.tv, my website, richieallen.co.uk. And it is also on TuneIn Radio. The programme is archived on podomatic.com. It is archived on the Truth Seeker application. Download Truth Seeker app. We're on Spotify. We're on iTunes as well. Tis wonderful. The age of technology. My good friend. My great friend. And it's a, it's a word I don't overuse. Friend. Because you don't have many of them in life. Not many true friends. Sounds very negative, doesn't it? Very negative. No. But I think you can count on one hand or even three fingers the true friends that you will encounter in your life, the people who take you warts and all. And a Gene Ann Crowley is certainly one of those. Phoned me this morning as I was in the middle of preparing this. <laughs> I thought she knows better than that. But she phoned me to tell me that she spilled coffee on her laptop and destroyed it. Jean Ann, who's approaching septuagenarian territory. She wouldn't mind me saying that. Or biography, which is on IMDb, which is on Wikipedia, outs her as a woman in her 60s. Is that a woman in your 60s type of thing to do? Spill water or coffee on your laptop? No, it isn't. I've done it before myself. So there you are. Mind your laptops. That's the lesson today, children. Mind your laptops. <laughs> they don't mix well with coffee. All right. Good morning to Base Ninja. Now, let's jump straight into the newspapers then. Loads to talk about. On the front page of The Times, the headline screams Tory rivals in hard Brexit bidding war. Tell you more about that in a minute. Also on the front of The Times, Boris swore and threatened me. More about that in a minute. So on the hard Brexit bidding war between Trump, between Trump, Freudian slip, between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt, the Times alleges that Johnson and Hunt are recruiting new Brexit negotiators ahead of the result of the leadership race. So they want to hit the ground running. Hunt and Johnson saying, well, if I win and become Prime Minister, I'll have a team of negotiators ready to hit the ground running. The Times alleges Johnson has brought in the three Brexiteers, <laughs> including... Termin terminological inexactitude, darling, Jacob Rees-Mogg, while Jeremy Hunt has apparently enlisted two senior Canadian politicians for his team of Brexit negotiators. Send in Anne Whittacombe, I say. Send in Anne Whittacombe in a ballroom dancing gown. Get her to tango. Right, let's leave that there. So that's hard Brexit bidding war. They're preparing for Brexit negotiations. This despite the fact that the European Union has said that the deal agreed with Theresa May, the withdrawal agreement, is all they are going to do. They won't negotiate any further. Okay. 
So what's this story about Boris Johnson swearing and threatening me? Last week, in fact it was the week before last, on the Friday, Johnson was alleged to have been involved in an argument with his girlfriend, Carrie Simmons, that got very loud. A couple of lefty neighbours recorded it, gave it to the Guardian, phoned the police. The police came along and said, nothing to see here, to see here. Nice. And the police left. But a woman who was a confidant of Boris Johnson's first wife has said that the Bojo threatened and harangued her over incendiary allegations about the couple's private life. Apparently, this woman called Louisa Gosling who was a 21-year-old Cambridge graduate when Boris Johnson's wife, Allegra Mostyn Owen, his first wife, came to seek sanctuary in the young students, well, the young graduates, flat. Johnson's first wife apparently turned up at Louisa Gosling's flat seeking sanctuary after having a blazing row. Okay. So Gosling says that Johnson's first wife made a serious allegation about him to her, which resulted in Boris Johnson, some days later, following the young Cambridge graduate, grabbing her by the arm, steering her into a bar, and threatening her about spreading lies. Bojo. This is in the Times. Is it true? It might be true. I have no idea. That's in the Times. The Sunday Telegraph front page headline is this. Boris to set up 100-day Brexit war cabinet. A war cabinet. 100 days. So if Johnson wins the race and becomes the Prime Minister, he's going to set up a war cabinet to sort out Brexit. It's a crack team, apparently. And it's going to take on the European Union. And it's going to ta tackle, even, every possible obstacle on the way to leaving the European Union on October 31st. This crack team would report back to the broader cabinet, which, would, which will be comprised mainly of ministers who signed up to Johnson's deadline. A Brexit crack team. Presumably working to the theme tune to the A-team. Crack commando unit was sent to prison for a crime they didn't commit. Bum, ba -da -bum, bum. So that's what's going on. Now, Boris was on Sky News, Sophie Ridge, this morning. They were in a school when she recorded her interview with him on Friday. Here's Boris Johnson speaking to Ridge on education. What will you do on education? Oh, Boris Johnson, what would you do? Well, I think education is the single most important thing that uh, we conservatives believe in, uh, in the sense that it is the tool that every kid should have uh, to make the most of their talents and, and their opportunities. And a great education is the job of the state to provide to, to absolutely everybody. And the, what's been happening in, in the UK over the, the last few years is, is that too many schools have been falling behind in the per capita provision. So what I want to do, day one, is level up and make sure that everybody, uh, primary schools and secondary schools, uh, get the funding they need. We're also announcing today something for uh, special educational needs schools as well. So what is that that you're announcing? Well, what we want to do is to give parents the ability, uh, where they think there's need, to go for uh, special educational needs schools, for, for free schools, and we will back that up and we'll support them. Because I think very often uh, local authorities need that extra help uh, to make sure they have enough provision nearby. So what's that mean, sorry? More money for...? It will, but it's part of our overall package of, 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 of about £4.6 So just let me get this straight. So you want to put more money into schools. I do. You want to put more money into transport in the north. You want to roll out full fibre broadband to every house in the country. You want to put 20,000 more police on the streets. And you also want to cut taxes. I mean, come on. That's having a cake and eating it. Yes, it's having your cake and eating it. Borrowing, 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 borrowing. Talk so much about this over the years. Borrowing from your own bank at interest to pay for your manifesto pledges. That is the key to it, children. By the way, I'm the biggest child in the room. You know that. That's the key to it. It's the key to people understanding the paradigm. Borrowing of money from yourself. Do you remember the great economist Steve Keen was on this programme over a year ago and I got him to accept this 
to concede, yes, you are right, Richie, it is ridiculous for, for example, Richie to borrow from the bank of Richie to pay for Richie's groceries and then pay back interest to the bank of Richie. <laughs> you know, you know, you know it's true. All right. So we'll leave that there. We've done it to death. Eventually people will understand this, but I'll be long dead when that happens. Would Boris suspend Parliament to force a no-deal Brexit? This lovely turn of phrase, prorogue. Would you prorogue Parliament, Boris? Would you to uh, get the uh, Brexit through? Prorogue? Well, this is the, this is the sort of prorogue. Proroguing Parliament? This is the other prorogue. Yeah, prorogue. Well, it's important. Yeah, proroguing, prorogue. Isn't it? It's well, really, really important. It, it, yes, but We're I think... We're talking about suspending Parliament. Shut up, love. You asked them. Let them answer. Parliament to push yes. something through. Yes. I mean, I think what's, what's much more important is that MPs understand the gravity of the situation and behave with responsibility and recognise that the only way to restore trust and confidence in politics is to get this thing done. So you won't rule it out? I don't like the idea of proroguing. I'm not remotely attracted to it, but, you know, MPs have got to understand that it's their responsibility to, to get this thing done. And that was by far, by far the best solution. I don't, I don't want to prorogue Parliament, nor do I expect to. I don't think that's going to be necessary. And I think it's far more important that MPs focus on, on where we are. Because politics has changed since March the 29th. And people can see that unless we get Brexit done, there is going to be a continuing hemorrhage of trust and of confidence in my party and and Labour as well. I mean, Labour, with spectacular incompetence, managed to go backwards in the council elections as well. That's how you avoid answering questions. That's a tip for you, my dearest listener. That is a tip for you. Wherever you are in society, in life, if you're under a bit of pressure, if you end up in, I don't know, in a debtor's court, in a small claims court, any place where you're being questioned, just do that. It's amazing. Just throw one real word in every four. Money, the problems, the issues, the children, family. That's how you do it. Marvellous. The interviewer just looks at his or her watch. It's wonderful. Now, Sophie Ridge asked Johnson about Nazanin al-Zaghari, who's in prison in Iran, and about the comments he made as foreign secretary, which were deemed to be grotesquely unhelpful to Nazanin al zaghari and her husband. But I won't subject you to those. She said, you know, you're a bit of a... She didn't say it exactly, Ridge, but she said you're a bit... I, I paraphrase. You're a bit loose with your language and you say things that are silly and you get people into trouble. So they talked about Nazanin al zaghari and his comments as foreign secretary and his tendency to say silly things. And then she put this to him. You see, it's not the first time that something that you've said has got you into trouble. I just want to talk a little bit about language that you've used. You've, in columns before that you've written, you've referred to black people with watermelon smiles. You've talked about... In a wholly top, satirical way, by the way. Tank can top... Just, can, can I, can I, can I, can I finish, yes, please? Yes, of course you can. Yes, course. Tank top bum boys. Women in burkas who look like letterboxes. Tank top bum boys. Did he actually say that? Women who wear burkas looking like letterboxes. We know he did say that. And we know he made the rather crass watermelon smiles quip go on sophie boxes and i want to put it to you that you're not homophobic you've supported gay rights you've supported women's right to to wear the burqa but you'll just say anything to get a laugh no. what's wrong with that saying anything to get a laugh <laughs> right. well i suppose there is something wrong with it if what you are saying is intended to cause distress to people or to one person that's not funny that's cheap and it's mean okay so Saying anything to get a laugh, I don't know. You know what I think? I've said it before about this Sargon character. I wouldn't ban any of these people. Everybody should be able to make their own minds up individually on whether something is tasteful or tasteless. We shouldn't be banning people or shutting them down because they say something that we don't like. But anyway, Bojo then. No, I think if you look at uh, each and every one of those... Uh columns or uh, articles, uh, you'll find that the quotations have been wrenched out of context, in many cases made to mean uh, the opposite of 
uh, what was intended. And actually, uh, look at my record uh, whilst I was uh, mayor of London, or indeed anything I've done. Look at, uh, if you want to look at somebody who's campaigned for, for gender equality, look at what we did in the, in the Foreign Office, uh, where I had a huge campaign for 12 years of quality education for every girl in the world that was actually massively successful, uh, taken up uh, by other countries, and I, which I believe passionately. Look at the way I ran London. Uh, we, you know, we had huge campaigns uh, to uh, protect the rights of, of women, particularly against uh, violence against women. And you know, I, I, I think some. See what I said earlier? Violence, women, foreign office context. Sometimes the, there is a tendency to. Uh, as I say, to take words out of context. So I just wonder rather if it sounds than to look a little, what I actually do, a little bit like someone who just won't take responsibility. You won't take responsibility for well, your words on Nazanin. You won't take responsibility for what you wrote in your columns. Just wrenched out of context. I mean, is that the quality we would want? No, on the contrary, I, I, look, I take full responsibility for everything I send you. But look at what uh, I've actually done. Look at what I take full responsibility uh, for. I yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot more waffling. We'll leave Boris there, shall we? It's uh, 16 and a half minutes past the hour, 16 and a half minutes past 11, as we speak, you and me, this fine, but uh, thankfully cooler Sunday morning here in Greater Manchester. The editorial in the Telegraph newspaper is outstanding this morning. It's outstanding. It's a short editorial, and it is headlined thus. The headline is, Do Remainers Even Understand How the European Union Works? Well... I would argue that the under-25s, the progressive momentum members under-25, those who are members of groups like Extinction Rebellion, do they understand how the European Union works? No, they don't. Let me read some of this for you briefly. It's good. It's good. It's in the Telegraph. It's good, but it's not right. It's good, but it's not great. It's good, but it is right. How many of the most fanatical Remainers in Britain can actually explain how the European Union appoints its top jobs? Do they understand what the Spitzen candidate process is? That's Spitzen candidate, by the way. Are they aware of how it has unravelled in recent days? If, as we suspect, the answer is no, then they are in love with the idea of the European Union not the undemocratic bureaucratic madness that is the actual European Union. Take the President of the European Commission, the job currently held by Jean-Claude Juncker, and that comes with a staff of over 30,000, a salary of around €300,000, and other perks, including, of course, an entertainment budget. Does every Remainer understand this post isn't even directly elected? That his or her name must have the support of a large majority of European Union leaders and only then it is put to the European Parliament? Or that Manfred Weber, the candidate whose party got the most seats in the recent European elections, has been discounted for lack of experience? If it all sounds less than democratic, then that's because it's supposed to be. The European model is essentially platonic, a veneer of democracy kept in check by divided powers and a self-selecting political class. It's a constitutional framework drafted by politicians who did not trust their own populations. It's a million miles from the British system where the government is formed from MPs elected directly by the people and in which Parliament is sovereign and the voters understand who is in charge and the limits of their power. Now that is reprehensible horse shit, that particular paragraph. Overall, it's a very good editorial. But the notion that we enjoy a democratic system of government in the UK is laughable. Laughable, right? You and I know this. But it's better, at least it appears to be better, than what the European Union and the European Parliament is. They go on to say, the Telegraph does, do militant Remainers not grasp this? The more we have seen of the European Union since the referendum, the clearer it has become to anyone paying attention that it is anti-ethical to British dem democracy. In fact, it's antithetical, antithetical. That's right. Say it right, Rich. <laughs> right. <laughs>
<laughs> to British democracy. Excellent piece in The Telegraph. That's their editorial this Sunday, June 30th. Sunday Express, front page, Farage's plan to fight new Prime Minister. The Sunday Express is moving away from the Hunt-Johnson contest and leading with the alleged plans of Nigel Farage to lead his Brexit party to general election success. Farage will apparently announce plans for a £200 billion investment in the regions at a rally and he will unveil more than 100 election candidates. That's according to the Sunday Express today. Sunday Mirror front page. Fury as defence chiefs blow £800 a night on top hotels. Sunday Mirror is reporting that the Ministry of Defence is using rooms that cost that cost over £800 a night for, for all manner of things. Okay? The tabloid also says bonuses for MOD civil servants have rocketed to £16 million a year. And charities that look out for the interests of army veterans are up in arms about this. Because the last person to be looked after is, of course, the traumatised PTSD-afflicted veteran returning home from Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever. Broken down. Built up. Sent over to a lunatic asylum that we've created. Subjected to unspeakable horrors and crimes and then they come home and their lives inevitably collapse veterans you know and they get sought all do they but defence chiefs can spend 800 pounds a night on top hotels that's in the sunday mirror it is mental star on sunday the headline is very brief you mugs you mugs the star on sunday is cheesed off that the bbc has scrapped free licenses for the over 75s but it is spending £3 million on branded items, including mugs, mouse mats, anoraks and umbrellas. That's in the Star on Sunday. Very interesting headline on the front page of the Sunday People today. It's the tabloid's interesting this morning. Lags, 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 that's L-A-G-S, get virtual reality holidays. How interesting. Sunday People leads on what it claims is an exclusive, saying that well-behaved prison inmates will be given an incentive to continue their good behaviour by being offered, as a reward, virtual reality holidays. This is going to tackle violence in prison. They'll get the headset, and they will put on the headset, and they will get 10-minute escapes to destinations like the Inca ruins in Peru or the Great Wall of China. Virtual reality holidays. How long before somebody comes up with the idea of imprisoning people in virtual reality cocoons, in a virtual reality box to save room in prisons? How long before that becomes an idea? Virtual reality. It's crazy, huh? Oh, it's just crazy. We're going to pause, me and you. And we're going to hear some music. Now, I purchased Bruce Springsteen's new album, Western Stars, and it is a wonderful thing. It is a beautiful thing. Like all very good or excellent albums, it's one that is a little bit of a slow burner. That's marvellous. You know, as an avid consumer of music of all genres, myself and a collector of uh, LPs, both, both rare and not so rare, I love the albums that take just a teensy bit of time to get into because they're the best albums. Bruce has released Western Stars. It's an album without the E Street Band. It's an album he won't be touring. He just dropped it and will be releasing another album with the E Street Band later this year and will be touring that in 2019. But Western Stars is beautiful and I've not heard a chill out record like it for some time. It is wonderful. It is lovely. I'm going to keep saying it. The adjectives fail me. So I'll just keep saying it's lovely. Here's the title track. It's called Western Stars. Roots were on. The title song from Western Stars, the latest release from Bruce Springsteen, which debuted at number one in the US and 
in the UK and most of Europe when it was released a couple of weeks ago. It's a thing of beauty, it really is. It's It's got ambience and it's music that is cinematic and takes you to another place. He's a bit of a genius. Uh, Mawinga says, I, I would like to see Springsteen one day. He's beginning to grow on me. I would recommend, you know, anybody who's suspicious of arena rock and stadium rock and big anthemic, anthemic or anthem rock, check out Darkness on the Edge of Town by the E Street Band and Bruce Springsteen, but check out Tunnel of Love, an album that, for me, I get asked all the time by friends, as much as listeners who know that I'm a big, obviously a big fan of music. So what's your favourite album of all time, Richie? And it's a difficult one, that. But I think the one I consistently go back to um, time and time again is Tunnel of Love by Bruce Springsteen, which is an album that he wrote when he was married to the actress Julie Phillips and he was finding a difficult marriage and them getting married was not the best idea for either of them. And at the same time, he was beginning to become very fond of uh, Paddy Shealfa, whom he's been married to now for, I don't know, 30 odd years or whatever. But Tunnel of Love is, is beautiful. It's just an incredible album. And um, The Boss is not all massive stadium gigs and, you know, anthemic type songs. He's incredible. He also recorded an album in 2006 or thereabouts, 2005, called The Seeger Sessions, where he put his own spin on the folk songs of the legendary Pete Seeger. And it's just wonderful to listen to. So I'm a big fan of his. I separate the man and his politics and his fondness for people like Barack Obama and all that. They just don't know any better. Most of my friends don't know any better and will believe in voting for Sinn Féin in Ireland or the Socialist Workers' Party. Most of my friends are still mired in the belief that they can change things at the ballot box. So I don't hold it against my friends, so I certainly don't hold it against somebody whose music has kept me going through some of the most difficult periods in my life, particularly when I was a young boy. And, you know, I've touched on that before. Listen, I'm going to talk briefly a little bit later on in this broadcast about the Hampstead Heath hoax. I know one or two people are listening in specifically for that. Uh, It is going to be brief, and it relates to the impromptu broadcast that I did yesterday morning. So I'll do a little bit about that. Hi to John Parsons in Salford. How you doing, John? Uh, thanks to um, uh, thanks for your tweet. Let me scroll on down. A hi to John Stott, who says, weren't there virtual reality prisons in Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One film? Predictive programming, asks John. Yes, mate, possibly. These are the damned. And David Stanford have referenced Total Recall, the excellent film with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sharon Stone, amongst others. Michael Ironside might have been in Total Recall as well. If my memory serves, boom, 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 pish. If I have perfect recall, yeah, excellent film, that. This is the story in The People that, for good behaviour, prisoners will be rewarded with a virtual reality excursion to places like the Great Wall of China. Conversely, Conversely, how long will it be before somebody thinks of, for punishment purposes, why don't we stick a virtual reality headset on them and send them somewhere really dark and really spooky and really scary? How long before that comes in? Hi to Cartoon Drunk who says, Boris was probably right when he said uh, Radcliffe was, was teaching journalism in Iran. She was probably trying to influence the press on Iran a cog in the wheel of regime change in Iran. They wouldn't just lock a tourist up for no reason, says Cartoon Drunk. And I can't um, add anything to that. It's N- Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe, of course. I said Nazanin Zagari earlier on, didn't I? Uh, so you're right to say uh, Ratcliffe. N- Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe is right. Yeah, I don't know, you see. You never get the truth, so you don't know. Dean Smith says the word robust, robust. The system loves that word, it certainly does. Hi to Sutti's Rehab, who says it's how the Rothschild Bank gets a billion a week out of suckers. This is fractional reserve banking. It ain't just the Rothschilds, though. But yes, I take that on board. Good morning to Seb Tomasini. How you doing, Seb? Uh, Thanks for uh, grabbing the programme live today. He's uh, just gotten a book called The Real Inconvenient Truth on Climate Change and is catching this show live for a change as well. Make it a good one, he says. I do my best, my friend. (laughs) 
The programmes are, I think, more often than not, decent. <laughs> Sometimes not great. And occasionally, crap. That's how it is in live broadcasting. Hi to Steve James that says, Springsteen is a musical genius. That he is. And I love the man. But I don't melt down when he's criticised. Keep that in mind. When, when people criticise Bruce and say he's an establishment shill and he's working for the... For, for, for the hidden hand and, and all of that I don't melt down and disown people why am I saying that? keep it in mind we'll return to that theme a little bit later on in the broadcast what else is in the papers? the mail on Sunday Corbyn rages at stroke claims that's the front page there was an article in the Times yesterday alleging that anonymous sources were concerned about the health of Jeremy Corbyn this is crap and grotesquely unfair I've used that term already this morning. Grotesquely unfair to Jeremy Corbyn, regardless of what do you think of him. Helen Pidd from The Guardian, Helen Pidd from The Guardian, was on the Andrew Marr show this morning on these claims about Corbyn's health and this rotten article in yesterday's Times. To be fair to Andrew Marr himself, before you hear Helen Pidd, Andrew Marr, well, he went up just a fraction in my estimation, did old Andrew. I mean, I've met him a few times recently and he has seemed completely vigorous and up for it as much as any 70-year-old man possibly could be. Yeah. Good man, Andrew. That's fair. He might get a kick in the uh, backside from his bosses for editorialising there, but it's only right that he say that. Because he has met Jeremy Corbyn for a series of interviews in the last three or four months and he is entitled to say, well, he looks pretty sprightly and he looks very well to me. So what does Helen Pidd from The Guardian say? I think so, although the Mail on Sunday today has resorted to pictures taken from before Christmas of him exercising one of those sort of gyms in, in the park. Yeah, it was curious, that uh, time story yesterday. It was full of anonymous quotes, and mm. I, I don't know, I, it just felt a little, bit, a little bit tawdry to me. I mean, he's come out on the offensive and said he's absolutely fine, but he's got so many problems within his party. And he won't enjoy the Observer front page story No, he won't. Uh, so the headline is, MPs to Corbyn get a grip or lose an election. So they've got, they're fighting on various fronts at the moment. There's, of course, the anti-Semitism controversy over Chris Williamson, the Derby MP, and his suspension. Angela Rayner, who's usually very, very loyal to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the Education Secretary, yes, said she was... Read out what she says. Yeah, it's she really said, quite dramatic. Yeah, so this was at the Fabian Society conference. What? At the Fabian Society conference? Angela Rayner, previously a Corbyn loyalist, was criticising him at the Fabian Society conference. The Fabian Society are great promoters of globalists and multiculturalism. Founded in 1884, at one time the Fabian Society advocated eugenics. They loved eugenics, sterilising people, scientifically planning societies. This is the Fabian Society. It's a, it's a, it's a society, a think tank society, that is often mentioned on The Richie Allen Show. I'd, I'd never heard of the Fabian Society until I began reading books by David Icke and others. Very sinister thing. So Angela Rayner was at the Fabian Society. <laughs> of course she was. What did she say about Jezza? Society conference yesterday and she said, I'm absolutely embarrassed by what's happened over the last few days and I've made my representations clear. If that means setting up an independent system, then so be it. Um, and then also inside the Observer, the report suggests that they have got a bit of a membership crisis and that they might have lost 100,000 members over the past year. Um, some of it might be down to the anti-Semitism stuff, but also Brexit of course and they're in this terrible bind with no I know there's a lot yeah. of worry about money coming into the yeah. party because they've become um, the old days the unions paid all the money yeah. um, but these days the membership subs are really really important to the Labour Party so they lose a hundred thousand members and that really matters yeah I mean but the 400,000 still sounds a fairly healthy membership to me so would love that. Yeah, exactly <laughs> they've got 160,000 you know all of whom are going to get to decide our next Prime Minister in this interminable race I still don't understand why it's going on for so long yeah that was Ian Dale from LBC weighing in there saying that some other parties would be proud of that membership namely his own party the Conservative Party so union boss Len McCluskey was very 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 unimpressed with the journalism in the Times yesterday he was on the Mar show this morning as well and he was properly cheesed off at the the way 
with the, the way in which the Times went about publishing the story. This is the story that Corbyn, that his health isn't great and he's not fit really to take on the coming challenges. In the Times yesterday, pretty wretched article, union boss Len McCluskey on, on, the Mara Show, not happy. I think uh, Rachel Sylvester and Alice Thompson, who wrote that piece, ought to be ashamed of themselves. No wonder British journalism is held in such low esteem yeah. throughout Europe. It was a disgraceful okay. well, thing. It's... It was fake news. It was lies. Well, it was distortions. I, they... Jeremy Corbyn is as fit as okay. a fiddle. He's one of the strongest individuals I've ever met. People 20 years younger can't they're, keep up with them. There's nothing okay. wrong with Jeremy. He's so strong that he's uh, entered himself into Britain's strongest man, which, which is at Manchester Arena in October. Tickets at manchesterarena.co.uk. Jeremy Corbyn taking on the world's strongest men. Corbyn is all right. There's nothing wrong with his health, I wouldn't imagine. There's plenty more wrong with Jeremy Corbyn without getting into his health. Hi to Phil Restino in Florida. How you doing, Phil? Wasn't aware that uh, Springsteen had a new album out. Liked the song Western Stars. No idea he had an album out, says Phil, but at the same time, I've never been a huge fan. That's what I said last week. It's it's not what you'd expect from Bruce Springsteen. But over the years, he's been very chameleon-esque, you know, in moving around and playing with genres and adapting and changing and exploring areas of music, which is, um, I suppose, one of the reasons why I love the man so much. A number of you have come back to me about the Fabian Society. Thank you. David says, don't forget Orwell and Huxley darkened the doors of the Fabian Loonies. That's right. John in Salford came back to say, I normally wouldn't go off a singer because of their political views, but I do make an exception for Bono. I can understand that. Hi to David Kona. How you doing, David? Long time no here. On a lighter note, the vision of Lizzo, Glastonbury 2019, will haunt my nightmares for many years to come. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right, we're going, we're going to move on, are we? We're going to move on? Going to move on because it's at 18 minutes to the top of the air. Lots to talk about. Shadow Chancellor John McDonald was on Sophie Ridge on Sunday. He was wearing an Extinction Rebellion badge. And he references them in answers given to Sophie Ridge. John McDonald says he'd like to delist businesses from the stock exchange if those businesses do not do their fair share on climate change. Right? It's like this. Look, we've, do, we've got through Parliament the declaration of a climate emergency. And I congratulate people like Extinction Rebellion. I'm wearing their sticker today. They've put climate change at the top of our agenda. So it's the priority for the next Labour government, basically. And what we're saying is we have to harness all our resources. So in the speech, I laid out all the state resources that will be made available. I also said we need private sector resources to do that. Here's how we'll attract them and manage them. But also, we've got to ensure that there's proper regulation of activity as well. We've got to have a just transition from a fossil fuel economy to a net zero carbon economy as soon as we possibly and can. And do you effectively trust the state to do this and not business? No, both. It's got to be both. But you're talking about that, a delisting company. No, that me, doesn't sound let, like No, let me go them. through it. Let me go through it. What we've got to do is have state resources that will invest in the economy alongside private sector resources that will invest in the economy as well. So we're looking at how do we coordinate that. What we've suggested is a sustainable investment board that brings together the Treasury, the Bank of England, business, the business department as well, alongside the private sector, in both in terms of businesses themselves and trade unions. We develop our investment programme and we ensure that we use our what powers each of us have got to divert and direct that investment into policies and investments that will tackle climate change. But also, if there are companies that aren't fulfilling their environmental responsibilities, that are undermining everything that we do, putting our planet at risk, there has to be some sanctions as well, and that's regulation. Uh, some people would say that this is government interference rather than regulation. Well, government has to intervene in a climate emergency. If we don't act now, and if we allow well, if we allow some of these companies that are developing policies that are undermining our very future, our existence, will never be forgiven. No socialist in the history of mankind would suggest what McDonnell is suggesting there. Delisting companies from the stock exchange if the companies don't do what they are told by the government of the day because of a climate hoax, climate change made by man, made by 
emissions of CO2, which isn't happening. That's not socialism. It doesn't come close to the definition of pure socialism. It's lunacy. It's totalitarianism. That's what McDonald is advocating there. And I'm not going to labour this because it's deadly serious. This is where we're going. Proudly wearing an Extinction Rebellion badge and proudly saying that Extinction Rebellion have now set the agenda. They've changed the whole political, the whole political landscape. And we, as the Labour Party, have put climate change as number one on our list of priorities because of Extinction Rebellion. If you don't believe me, you might be listening to this on YouTube, you might be listening to it on Podomatic or on Spotify or on iTunes. Just rewind a little bit and listen to what McDonald says. That's tyranny. That ain't socialism. Now, Chris Williamson, the Derby MP, was left back into the Labour Party for a few hours, then he was um, suspended again over anti-Semitism. Of course, Sophie Ridge was going to get into that. What does McDonald think about Chris Williamson and anti-Semitism? I won't comment on any individual case, because if, if you do, um, you're accused of prejudging a case. Chris's case will go before, I think it's back to the NEC itself, the Disputes Committee, and then the full NEC, and it'll be decided then. That's due process. I remember in Hastings a year ago asking you about anti-Semitism yeah. at that point. Well, you know my answer. I was angry about, and I said what we need to be is faster and more ruthless. That's my attitude all through, and still is. Are you still angry? What angers me is that, um, you know, we, we... Do you know what angers us, John? Do you know what angers us? What angers us is that when you were a useless non-entity of a backbencher, just like the bearded scruffball Corbyn, your pal, right? When you were backbenchers, you would laugh in the face of these claims of anti-Semitism. You would speak out about the Zionist lobby influence in the UK, you would take it on. But then you find yourself somehow, you're probably still a bit dizzy, in the limelight and on the front bench. How the hell did that happen? What do you do now? Do you speak out about Jewish power? Zionist lobbies acting here in the UK? Remember Shai Massot? Remember? You don't say anything. You capitulate just like your social democrat pal Jeremy. That's what we are angry about. We are an anti-racist party. We should be leading the campaign against anti-Semitism. Oh, Jesus. In society overall, and this is holding us back. What we've got to do is move forward now, make sure, and I think the... the in Piss off. We'll leave that there. There's nothing new in that. Cowards. Cowards. Here's an article in the Sunday Times I think you'll find very interesting. This is Sunday View with me, Richie Allen, live on Fab Radio 2, richieallen.co.uk, triggerwarning.tv, multiple platforms uh, on Tinternet, archived on Spotify, iTunes, podomatic.com, and it's on the Truth Seeker app. Sunday Times, story inside the paper. Feminists celebrate U-turn on self-identification in Scotland as women's prisons review trans policy. That's the headline. The article reads, Scotland has shelved plans to allow people to self-declare their legal gender in what feminists said was a major victory for women's rights and a clear signal to politicians in Westminster. Now the proposals would have allowed anyone over 16 to change gender on the same day or after a brief waiting period, just by signing a declaration. Scottish ministers had said they believed the current law, which demands that applicants seek a doctor's diagnosis and live in their new gender role for two years to be intrusive and onerous. So, snowflake progressive politicians didn't like the old way that you had to seek a doctor's diagnosis and you had to live in your gender role for two years. So they wanted to change that and they wanted to make it easy to self-identify on the same day by signing a declaration. Feminists said no, this is not good. They opposed it. They organised online and began fighting it. And they were backed by Scotland's main women's organisation, which is 90% funded by the Scottish government. Okay. They said 
these proposals to allow self-declaration put women at risk by giving male-bodied people access to changing rooms, women's prisons, rape crisis centres and other protected areas. Trans lobbyists said there was no evidence for this, but there's a wealth of evidence. We know that men who identify as women have gone to women's prison, prisons and have raped women while there. We know this. But the trans lobbyist said there was no evidence for this. This is the paradigm of the 20th century snowflake. Millions of them. Acute narcissistic personality disorder. I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes. If I believe it to be so, then I believe it to be so. If I say there is no evidence for this, then there must be no evidence for this. Except there is evidence for it. <laughs> this is the problem. Acute narcissistic person personality disorder. Sufferer. This is the problem. There is overwhelming evidence that women are at risk. Nicholas Sturgeon. Progressive. Said concerns were misplaced. But she had to retreat. When. When the overwhelming. Prevailing. Overwhelming opinion was. This is dangerous. We can't allow people to self-declare. I'm a unicorn today, I'm a pig tomorrow, I'm a spider tomorrow, I'm a man today, I'm a woman tomorrow. No, no. And just to compound the nonsense from the trans lobbyists, just to compound the lies of the trans lobbyists, that, that, that there's no evidence that women are in danger, only this year a Scottish transgender sex offender was preying on young girls in supermarket toilets, was then sent to live in a women-only hostel. Katie Dolotovsky, allegedly, who was born male, was spared prison, even though he had sexually assaulted a 10-year-old, called himself Katie. This was on the Andrew Marr show earlier on, and you might be pleasantly surprised to hear what the tennis legend Martina Navratilova, a gay lesbian woman, you might be pleasantly uh, surprised to hear her take on all of this. Martina Navratilova on the Mar Show. Uh, I, I, I think for me, uh, no, I mean, it opened my mind, I think, to the plight of transgender and how difficult it mm. is for them. Uh, because I, I did not know enough about that. But it's always been about fairness in sport. And we cannot have sympathy and empathy for transgender on a smaller level, on, on sport level. Uh, Trump, for lack of a better word, uh, or overtake uh, fairness mm -hmm. for women and girls, and on a bigger stage, with the with the with what's happening in in uh, in Scotland and the self ID, etc. We cannot let self ID take over and endanger women and overall. We, we think about this as being a new issue, but actually, you you were playing against a trans athlete way way back, weren't you? Somebody who transitioned from male to female. Absolutely. It was Dr. Renee Richards, and I played against her. I was number one in the world. She was rank, She was 43 years old, and I had my hands full. I, I, and she said herself, had she been 10 years younger when she transitioned, she would have kicked her behind, and I think she's right. Mm. So. Helen, I don't know what you make of all of this, but the story here is really interesting because mm -hmm. it's, it's about a surge in girls in particular switching gender. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is a very interesting development. We were talking about it before. You were saying kind of in the 70s, it was overwhelmingly male to female, um, the sort of transgender switch. And I mean, it's, I, I kind of wonder if there's a lack of, of, of lesbian role models, maybe? Because I don't know if... What, what do you what, what do you think for kind of young <laughs> An girls? Over to a lesbian <laughs> role model. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit. Bad. No, no, do now you, it's. Do you know what like... I mean? So, so say if you're a young, you know, you're yes. a young, maybe tom tomboyish right. girl, and you think, well, that's who are my role models? There's Kim Kardashian. You know, that's the sort of overwhelming thing in the yes. media, and then. I think I think in post puberty, it's it's more even, but now pre puberty or the younger ones, it seems to be girls are switching gender more than than, than boys, and I wonder how much of it has to do with them just being tomboys and being, mm. you know maybe being lesbians and they just don't know it yet uh, but this is what they feel that they would rather be and boys do you, I don't do know do you remember that period in your life very I, clearly I was a tomboy look I had short hair I hated skirts always uh, and and so many times I said no this is the this is the ladies room you need to go to the, to the boys room but I'm not my girl so I don't know how much of it is societal change societal pressure uh, but I just want people to take their time because this is a this mm. is a big switch Good stuff from Martina Navratilova. It's uh, five and a half minutes to the top of the air. I'm going to run over a couple of minutes, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Graham Booth, by the way, the legendary Graham Booth, 
in uh, South Manchester. Trigger warning. TV. Graham will be taking. Uh, will be having. Will be providing his own inimitable look at current affairs and current events on TriggerWarning.tv and on the Trigger Warning YouTube channel. Graham will be going live in a few minutes' time and I do recommend you look at that. Had a tweet yesterday from somebody called The Second Going. Really disappointed with Richie Allen's show. Uh, Ian Crane is a brilliant human being. I've lost so much respect for you. Uh, Somebody else, Allen is a shill. He's working for the establishment. He should be investigated going after real truthers. This is Stockholm Syndrome. So I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'm going to go and I'm going to leave this once and for all. How do you get to a place in your life where you fly into a rage because somebody has challenged your point of view? A rage. And why? How do you get to that place where you fly into a rage because someone you've never met, me, has challenged your point of view or takes a different perspective or has a different opinion of another person or even another story. Why? And I'm going to tell you why. And I've gone into this on the programme many times. Acute narcissistic personality disorder runs rampant among people who consume the alternative media and consume alternative media exclusively. Acute narcissistic personality disorder. You don't see it in the old or the older or the more experienced. You don't see this because they're not afflicted by it. Because they were brought up to deal with with those who disagree with you. To deal with those who challenge your perspective. And to deal with those who argue with you. And to not take that personally. To not feel slighted. Or to not feel attacked. Because somebody takes a different point of view than you. You don't see it in older people. You see it in people, I think my age and younger. Acute narcissistic personality disorder. There is a million and one reasons why people have reached that point in their life. Social media has an awful lot to do with it. Living on social media, living on Facebook, living on Twitter and on Instagram. The imagination, the the fantasy that you are an important person and that what you have to say is empirically important must be because you've gathered a few hundred or a few thousand followers on Facebook or on Twitter. So you must be important. Then you surround yourself with those who have the same opinions as you and who like your content and share it. This has been going on for years and it creates more insular, more inward looking people. Narcissistic people. That's what it creates. It shouldn't matter. Even if I was wrong about Ian Crane and his partners in lies. I'm not wrong. But imagine I was wrong. It shouldn't matter, should it? A level-headed person disagreeing with me would say, I think Richie's wrong there. I think he's been a bit unfair. But anyway, what else is on the programme? I just think he's wrong. Right? Wrong. The outraged and acute narcissistic personality disorder instills in people permanent outrage when their views or their likes are challenged. There was only a half a dozen of these yesterday, but it's important. The outraged are certain of one thing. They're always right. I know the truth. I have sent money to the truther. I paid to attend a truther industrial complex conference. I couldn't possibly be wrong. Because by criticising him, Richie, or anybody else, you're calling me wrong. Isn't that incredible that we've reached that position? That we've reached that juncture in human development? You have highlighted, Richie, the pathological lies told by these people. You have exposed it. You've provided proof of it. Not just you, but others. I'm going to vent my spleen and my rage at you because I couldn't be wrong. I went to see them. I handed over my hard-earned cash. I can't be wrong. Acute narcissistic personality disorder. You know what's wrong with you? You are an addict and your drug is validation. You are addicted to validation because you are a narcissist. Crane and his cohorts are your comfort blanket. When you are confronted with evidence that the guy lies and posts fake news, clickbait stories, you get enraged and you scream abuse at the messengers. The truthers are your dealer. They provide you with your daily fix. And let me tell you this, a smackhead, if given a shotgun, would shoot a cop before shooting his dealer. (laughs) This is a fact. And I did post on Twitter yesterday 
evidence of Crane making ludicrous claims that Sydney had stopped 5G rollout after a legal challenge. Lies. Lies. Dozens of examples of it. Lies. Lying about people getting nosebleeds and insomnia at Glastonbury, providing no evidence of it. And when challenged, just ignoring the challenges. Somebody sent me a video of somebody with an EMF reader at Glastonbury. Proof of nothing. Proof of nothing. Certainly no proof that people had insomnia, that people were suffering nosebleeds and migraines. It's a lie. You have a quarter of a million people at the festival. Are we really to believe that many of those people were emerging from their tents, looking for some place to report that they had headaches and nosebleeds? It's a nonsense. Were there high levels of um, electromagnetic frequencies at Glastonbury? You bet your life there were. You bet your life there were. You got a quarter of a million people, most of them with smartphones. What do you think is going on there? There was an electromagnetic smog there. And that's before the advent of, or excuse me, the the positioning of 5G transmitters there, which may well have been used at Glastonbury this weekend. It might be. I have no idea. And I know damn well what 5G is going to do. It's a global killer. I'm well aware of it. Ludicrous claims. Ludicrous claims made by people. And you don't believe, you don't, you you won't countenance, you won't tolerate any questioning of it because of your acute narcissistic personality disorder because you believe it's an attack on you. You're sick. You're sick and you're no use to me or anybody else. Right? Disinformation. What does the disinformation do? It destroys the credibility of real researchers. And that's the whole point, really. The people doing real work on these issues whether it be vaccines, whether it be, whether it be geoengineering, anything, Syria, anything. They destroy the credibility of real researchers by their behaviour. And lazy social media users retweet and share that crap and it travels the world. You share without question. You don't check it out, you share it. And it's rubbish. And the point for me in making this programme is to accept, as I have accepted, that 99.99% of the population are not aware of the agenda. They are blissfully unaware of it. So this platform is to present mostly credible folks, mostly, I've had some wackos on, of course, mostly credible folks who present unimpeachable evidence that geoengineering, harmful vaccinations, some harmful vaccinations, depopulation, mind control are real agendas. And I take on the misomaniacs in the alternative media. And I've explained misomania to you before. Not to attack anyone, but to grab you by the shoulders and to shake the shit out of you. Wake up to what's going on. Ian Hilpus, Ian Hilpus, 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 on Twitter, follows this show. Have you been got at, Richie? Wow. What makes you say such a stupid thing? Hampstead was real, but covered up so brilliantly that it fooled you. This is the acute narcissistic personality disorder. I disagree with this person, Ian Hilpus. So I must have been got at then. It must be true. Because he must be right. The Hampstead Heath hoax, laughable though it is, and I'll explain why in a minute, must be real, Richie. And the fact that you don't share that opinion, well, you must have been got at. Who got at me? I don't have a pot to piss in. Nothing. Nothing. The savings I had gone on getting into a house that I didn't, that none of us wanted to buy. When I say none of us, I mean people in general. Want to be getting involved with banks. Nothing. So who's got at me, please? And if somebody wants to get at me, MI6, if you're listening, NSA, MI5, I need a few bobs. So I'll tell you what, if you pay me enough money, <laughs> I'll start shilling for you. Madness. This is the mentality, right? Hampstead Heath, a hoax, foisted on the consumers of alternative or independent media by goons like Brian Gerrish and the fat little truther himself, Ian Crane. Children were forced to eat babies after they were killed with cleavers. The blood from the babies was poured into silver bowls. The children themselves 
Ella Draper's kids were sold for £50 each every single day. This is what the kids were coached to say. They said the police were involved in it. The whole school was doing it. All the teachers and all the local clergy. All the children were forced to do sex to Ella Draper's son, said Ella Draper's son on a YouTube video. Do you remember that? At the parties, his father kills babies and eats the meat, he said. All the teachers, all of dad's friends were involved. All of them killing babies with cleavers. The school nurse was involved in it as well. Baby skulls were used in weird rituals, said the children. The children said a shoe repair shop was used to make shoes out of baby's skins. Now to the, to the, to the person afflicted by acute narcissistic personality disorder. It doesn't matter that an audio recording is available freely for people to listen to of the mother's boyfriend actually coaching the children to say this stuff. Amazingly. It's there. What's even more incredulous and should leave you incredulous is despite the police having the recording of the friend, of the boyfriend even, coaching the children, the police actually took these allegations seriously. Shoes made out of baby skins, cleavers, baby, everybody eating babies, all the school, the parish priest, all the teachers, McDonald's, Right? Ian Hilpus. Have you been got at, Richie, because you don't believe this? <laughs> wow. The police actually took it seriously. And the sheep who fell for this story, sorry to call you sheep, and still refuse to accept it as a hoax. God love them. You're not well. So you'll come back and you'll say, the kids were examined and there were signs of abuse. Dr. Deborah Hodes, Hodes or Hodes, a consultant, community paediatrician and a fellow of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health did give an anogenital exam to both children. She thought she found signs of abuse, rectal abuse, right, around the children's bottoms. Said there were scars, healed fissures. And also said there was reflex anal dilation in one of the children. So the, the narcissists who fell for this point to the doctor's initial findings. They conveniently ignore the fact that the doctor recanted this particular finding, met with other doctors. They convened a panel. They had a look at it again and they said, well, in fact, the fissures were actually irregularities and it might have been possible normal variant. That there wasn't any overwhelming evidence that the children had been raped. Madness. A satanic paedophile ring working out of a primary school with everybody involved in it. Children being sodomised with dildos. Being forced to participate in the murder of babies and the eating of babies. Ah well eh? And what's really going on here with that? Well, the Savile revelations had only come to light a couple of years before, after the death of Jimmy Savile. And I have speculated time and time again that because satanic ritual abuse is real, I believe it is real, it does happen and has happened. I believe that all sorts of stuff was coming out about Jimmy Savile and the public's appetite for this was voracious, meaning the public was opening its eyes to it. So, you've got classic Empire Strikes Back stuff, right? You've got misdirection and you've got hoaxes perpetuated or hoaxes put out into the public domain knowing that people would believe it and knowing that it would be easy to debunk it then. I interviewed Sabine McNeil who believed every word of it, God love her. I contacted the mother and her boyfriend they wanted assurances from me that I agreed with them and that I believed them, otherwise they would not come on. When I wouldn't give them such an assurance, because I can't, they refused to come on the programme. People like Brian Gerrish paraded Ella Draper and her boyfriend around, used them as a prop to convince 
his tiny band of followers that he was some crusader against child abuse. He was a story. I'm the man revealing this stuff. I'm the man. And his hoaxer pals went along with it. It is a lie. Provable lie. And it nearly cost people their lives in Hampstead. I could never understand why people like Gerrish were not arrested and interviewed under caution for some of the things they said and claimed. None of it was true. Have children been subjected to unspeakable things, unimaginably evil things, in ritual in ritualistic abuse situations? I believe so. And I've interviewed people, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists. I've interviewed psychiatrists who have debunked the false memory um, thesis. Because when this stuff started to come to light many years ago, the establishment fought back by claiming it was false memory syndrome. I don't buy into that. Never have done. Hampstead Heath. And you want to come back at me and talk to me about it being unfair that I'm going after, and I am occasionally, and like I said yesterday, Ian Crane and these goons, they're nobodies. But the problem is there are tens of thousands of them. As long as they give you your daily, your daily, your, your daily fix, which is they tell you what you want to hear. They tell you that you're right. You're right. You're right to believe in geoengineering. You are right. You're right to think that what's happened in Syria is a disgrace and that the Syrian government is not using chemical weapons on its own people. Yes, you are right to think that. But some of the people presenting that information have been compromised. Like the English woman based in France who poses in front of the Eiffel Tower holding a Syrian flag. Who um, said that the president had told her that the Syrian forces were indeed torturing people but that she would keep that secret because she didn't want it falling into the hands of Assad's enemies. These are the people. Somebody said to me yesterday, Ah, Richie, what did they say? You're a bullshitter, Richie. You call yourself a journalist. All you ever done, Richie, was worked on some expat radio station in Spain. I've got degrees and diplomas falling out of my arse. I produced one of the most successful talk programmes on uh, commercial radio in Ireland for some years. Award winning. I have taught radio production and journalism for a number of organisations. I'm the fucking guns of the Navarone when it comes to the independent media. And you want to say to me, how can you? You must have been got at. Because I said the Hampstead Heath hoax is a hoax. You're sick. You're fucked. And you're no use to me. You're no use to anybody else. I pity you that when your heroes that you've invested your money in are challenged and are outed as the frauds they are, that rather than deal with that, even if you say, ah, Richie, or whoever it is, ah, Richie's an arsehole, but he's got some interesting stuff on his programme, I'll just ignore that. No, 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 no. No. You go absolutely batshit crazy. You can't deal with that, can you? Acute narcissistic personality disorder. It's running through, through even society like the zombie apocalypse. And that's why I prefer the company of older people because you can say anything to an older person they can say anything to you they can call you bollocks they can call you a fucking idiot and I'll go yeah alright yeah I'll give you that yeah maybe I was there we, we, we can talk we can we can disagree I've had arguments with Hayden Hewitt about geoengineering and they've become very heated at the television studios in Manchester what do we do at the end of it Hayden has his opinion I have my opinion what do we do at the end of it we say, right, that was good today. Quick hug. Talk to you on the phone tomorrow, pal. But the consumers of the independent media are far more asleep, are far more, are further away from the truth than the people blissfully unaware getting their news from the BBC and The Guardian. And I know you don't want to hear that, but it's absolutely true. Like it or lump it. That was um, Sunday View. I'll see you tomorrow for the papers at 930 on YouTube. Bye for now. This is Bruce and the Wayfarer. Another track from his new album, Western Stars. 
Look after yourselves and one another. Have a lovely Sunday. Speak tomorrow. Listen to Graham Booth right now on TriggerWarning.tv on YouTube. He's a top man too. Bye now.